this, this is uh, Michael Hayes. I am uh, doing a veterans interview for the Veterans History Project for Dewey W. Gowdy, who was born on October 10th, 1923. He lives in Columbia City, Indiana. He was born in Thorn Creek Township, Whitley County, Indiana. He served in the U.S. Army in World War II. He received the Good Conduct Medal, the D Distinguished Badge, World War II Victory Ribbon, American Theater Ribbon, the, the EAME Theater Ribbon with two bronze stars, and has 30 caliber rifle marksmanship medal and the M1 carbine marksmanship medal. Uh, Dewey, uh, tell, tell me about your, uh, did you, were you uh, drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. <clears throat> the three on my serial number is a draftee and the one is an enlisted man. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, and you were living in Columbia City at the time? Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne. Mm -hmm. okay. I was working for the Air Force at Bear Field. Oh. Uh, where did you go to boot camp? Patterson Field, uh, Dayton, Ohio. <clears throat> and then. Do you, you remember anything uh, <laughs> interesting about boot camp? Oh, it was rough, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> and uh, we had a good good group of men that we graduated with, and at the same time behind us they were training uh, Chinese to fight <laughs> under their own. They were from China. They were, in, they were in a separate unit, but they were right there with us, oh. which is unusual. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that would be. Okay, once you finished your boot camp, uh, tell me about uh, preparing to go overseas. I was assigned to headquarters at Bear Fe I mean at Patterson Field for, uh, and worked in the headquarters. And we uh, made up units for overseas duty uh, that summer. That's what I worked at with the first sergeant and the first of the field and it was sort of like a repel depot and we made up squadrons of uh, units to go overseas. And that's what I worked at all uh, that summer after I got out of the basic training. And uh, we, <laughs> and that's what happened. Well, my, the old first sergeant, he and I were buddies and uh, he was talking to me one day and he said, Dewey, I'm tired of this stuff, let's get out of here. And at that even time, we'd, he'd looked it over, we had the orders to form a unit for Italy. And so we all volunteered and we took about 20 people out of the headquarters at <laughs> that, that Patterson Field. And we took them right out and we signed up to go with this unit which was going to be formed and uh, we had to go to uh, uh, Mitchell Field, Long Island and that's when we started for overseas and in November. But <laughs> we sent our own, uh, we made up our own <laughs> time in my that's mind. Very interesting. <laughs> and uh, we sent a lot of boys overseas before that but he was tired of the States. <laughs> okay, so you left for Europe uh, when? Uh, on, uh, what was I, I wrote it down there. <laughs> yeah, uh, on the 26th of November, we left for uh, Mitchell Field, Long Island, with uh, about 25 guys we recruited out of our area and they had to form this 20th, 28th statistical control unit. And they made, they 
came from all over the United States there, uh, assembled at Mitchell Field, New York. And they recruited from Air Force stations in almost every state in the Union. And uh, um, I said, oh, well, over half of them were volunteers. We didn't have to go, but we wanted to go. <laughs> And they were officially activated on the, in the, the ninth or the second of December, 1943. And we uh, stayed a week in Long Island, and it was December, cold. <laughs> and and uh, finally, we had the outfit assembled, ready to go overseas. And well, they put us on a. A train, a sleeper, and uh, told us that we didn't dare to lift the blinds. <laughs> Couldn't, <laughs> and uh, went. We just left Mitchell Field, and the next morning we were stopped in a place, and we didn't know where we were. And they told us we didn't dare to look out. <laughs> but one of the guys, he peeked, of course, and he says. My gosh, I live right up there on the hill. We was in Roanoke, West Virginia, in Virginia. <laughs> he says, I live right up there. There's my house. <laughs> and he was that close to home. <laughs> and we went out into the swamps to Camp Patrick Henry. And we started uh, training for combat overseas. And we, they gave us all of our equipment and everything. And we was there a week. And uh, we finally embarked on the, on the James Moore uh, Liberty ship from uh, Hampton Roads on the uh, yeah on the 14th of December of, nine, of 1943 and we were 35 days before and we were in storms and we in a convoy and it was rough we were and we had a problem. The Liberty ship was manned by the Merchant Marine, and the, maybe, I don't know. We had a problem. I got the right here the proof of it. But they had rations to feed 400 men over and maybe prisoners back, and they didn't give us any food. We just about starved to death. We began to even had uh, a meningitis till we got to Italy. We was there 35 days and they were saving the food for the black market. Now I'm all of this. <laughs> I'm, I got the proof right here. <laughs> but uh, we turned them into the port authorities when we got off the ship, but it, was, it didn't do us any good. I mean, of course, but we might have pissed up somebody else. We got into Italy. And we stopped in Sicily at Syracuse, and it was bombed out quite a bit. And they had to wait to the harbors cleared up in Italy so we could move up. We went up into uh, Toronto, Italy, and we got off a ship in Toronto. And uh, cargo nets and down into the landing craft, and away we went. <laughs> and I was 19 and never been out of Harley Whitley County, and there I am landing on a foreign soil. <laughs> <laughs> And I can't remember when that we got off that landing craft. We were not under fire, don't get me wrong, but we moved up into an olive orchard and they had a, a, a kitchen set up. And they well, I had a good hot meal prepared and I had a piece of chicken. It was army chicken, you know, that's just a long neck full of wings. That's all, that's what an army chicken is. <laughs> 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 so there, all the other parts went to the somewhere else, <laughs> the good part. <laughs> and I got this piece of chicken, sat down, leaned up against an olive tree, and a little Italian girl, about four years old, in, De in January. And it was not too warm. She walked up there and just stood there, and I can see her blue eyes today. <laughs> and she got my chicken, <laughs> and I was hungry. <laughs> But uh, then we, they loaded us on the 40 and 8s, you know what they are, boxcars, 40 horses, 
there, 40 men and eight horses <laughs> and straw and everything, and we traveled all night uh, to Barry, Italy. And we got into Barry the next morning, and uh, they took us into where we were. To the head, they had a, a, a headquarters set up for the 15th Air Force, but then they buried, we were bivouacked in a, another building. There was a, an old, I don't know, stone building, but it was cold <laughs> and no heat <laughs> or nothing. But that's how I and arrived in Italy. <laughs> okay, when uh, you arrived at your base, or mm -hmm. we spent the then next year and a half there, almost two, in in Barry. That was the headquarters for the whole 15th Air Force, and they had we had uh, when we finally got operational. It didn't take long because they were wanting us real bad. It said. Right uh, here it is uh, our, my outfit. What I was in was the application of the best technical methods of the U.S. big business to aerial warfare. In the 15th Air Force, it was proved invaluable in planning combat missions against the enemy. Wow. And that's what our job was. And we finally got organized, and for a year and a half, that's what we done. Mm -hmm. Everything come in, and the general. Twining, Nathan Twining, and uh, we worked for him. And he had to have this, what ships he had to fly, he had to have that there, and the ones that were operational, and how many men he had, and every gun, and every piece of ammunition, every bomb, <laughs> had to be accounted for. <laughs> and it was, I got, <laughs> and for a, a year and a half we done that. And we had, uh, the, the airfields were stationed all over Italy, and that's, a lot of them were old, the ones that uh, Mussolini had used. <laughs> and uh, they were, and, uh, they were uh, under, well, under the command of Point. I don't know how many groups we had, but there were a lot of them. And, uh, we, <laughs> that was my job for a year and a half, wow. figures. <laughs> and we had everything. We had draftsmen. We had operators. We had control units, uh, MRI, machine records units. And uh, uh, what a downtime of the state of the art of uh, computerized work. You know, we had sorters and printers and, oh. <laughs> and try key punch. <laughs> and the old IBM cards, <laughs> and, and then we, but that's what we done then for a year and a half. Uh, did you come under uh, any uh, German uh, strafings or? Not directly. When we first moved in, the uh, the harbor there where it was a entrance point for supplies. And uh, they had been, just a week or so before we got there, they'd been blown to heck. They, they, in fact, they destroyed more. Uh, the Germans came over in 88 and under the radar, and about 100 of them. And uh, they bombed the harbor. And they got more ships there than they did in Pearl Harbor. But they weren't battleships. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, the, we had one guy, uh, he'd come over about every night, on oh, JU-88, <laughs> and we'd wait for him, but we never got him. He was up there about, he had, it must have been a strip job because he was up too high, but he was taking a lot of pictures. <laughs> and we, the harbor was blowing at that time, and I got uh, to home, I didn't bring it with me, but they had, a ship was blown up that had mustard gas, <laughs> and uh, people don't know that. We had that mustard gas there in case the Germans used it 
from the top. But the, the sailors that were blown into the water were coming out all burnt, and they couldn't figure it out. Because nobody knew that mustard gas was on that one ship. The ship was uh -huh. blowing the heck. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and they, again, in 54, the government released it, that they had mustard gas there. And then they figured it out, but you know, went for years that nobody, we didn't know what, why they were damaged like that. They were burnt. That mustard gas was into the water. <laughs> then in another, in 1943, or 44, no, it was 45, yeah, in April, uh, there's one, a ship, they come, uh, they're not sure what happened, but <coughs> a ship, uh, Liberty, was loaded with 500 palm bombs. And the Germans came over. We don't know whether it was them or what, but anyway, the, the ship was ex exploded and just took about four ships with it, you know, and that put half the harbor. <laughs> and I was about a half a mile, and I was knocked flat. But uh, I wasn't damaged or anything, and uh, actually, the only we lost uh, two men. They were old timers. They'd come in from Africa, and they they'd been war weary. And and after that, we had to send them home. That's the only two we ever lost. You might say to <laughs> to action, <laughs> and, and they weren't in a direct fire. You know, they were just concussion. Mm -hmm. They just couldn't get up. They were couldn't do it. <laughs> couldn't do it no more. Wow. <laughs> so uh, when you uh, were ready to come home, was what had was the war over at that yeah. point? They had wait. Uh, we had about three months there uh, to uh, close things up, and we made this here. And it's it was the the whole system, the whole every gun, every uh, plane that went down, every uh, locomotive they destroyed, and uh, every every almost every bullet that was fired, we kept meticulous records of. And this is a compilation of it, and it is down at Patterson under the 15th Air Force. Ah. But uh, we worked at that till they were broke the whole 15th Air Force and then they started to disperse us and we went all different directions. And I, my orders were to report to the Philippines. As <laughs> and we put our equipment, some of it, on a boat. Liberty with four recruits who had just come in and we sent them. I think they're still waiting for me over there in the Philippines. <laughs> After 60 years, I never showed up over there. <laughs> uh, but uh, we put them on. They went through the Suez Canal and that way around the world and I, I come home. We I went down to Repel Depot in Naples and waited for a ship. Old first sergeant and I, we were together, yet we stayed together three years. And I had another buddy that was with me for three years. We went through basic together, went to Italy together. And he came home about a month before I did. He flew home, he got, he was a staff sergeant, I was only a but, but he flew home. And uh, he was my, he became my brother-in-law. After I got back, he came out to visit me, and he met my sister. And, and so he was my brother-in-law, and we were together. He died about five years ago. Wow. And we've had my outfit, and we've had reunions all over the United States. And I'm, well, as far as I can tell, there are two of us left. We went all over. Yeah. And it was really a an experience, you know, to oh, yeah. be friends. We just the women would go shopping, and we'd sit and talk Cold War stories, and <laughs> tell a lot of lies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, 
long time ago. Yeah. But I came home on another Liberty ship and I was looking at the History Channel here the other day and old Kaiser built these Liberty ships, you know, and he's been putting out a one a day. And they were welded, which was a new experience. And they had Rosie the River, they didn't have, they had Rosie the Welder. <laughs> and they were not familiar with it, really. Some of them, they said 40 of them broke in two, right in front of the forecastle. Mm -hmm. 40 of the ships had been just went like that and they were down and within three or four minutes they didn't know. And we were in that forward hold for 35 days there, but we made it. We didn't go down. We was in a convoy too. But, uh, it wouldn't make any difference. They said if you went down you'd never be, re they couldn't pick you up. But Kaiser made a band in around the ship to hold it together. <laughs> and I went over and back on one of those ships. <laughs> U.S. Moore, James Moore going over and a Tristram Dalton coming home. So you had the band on your, on your ship? I don't know. We didn't get sunk anyway. We didn't break in two. <laughs> there was about 400 of us going over in different outfits. And uh, well, we had Christmas. You know, out there in the middle of the Atlantic, and we uh, formed our own program that evening, Christmas Eve, had a good time. Yeah. And they passed out a little sack of uh, goodies, you know, like toothpaste and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there, on, and they wouldn't let us out, we couldn't get out on the deck because it was too dangerous in the storms. And, and I was leaning up against a guy. And he was in a completely different outfit than I was. And uh, the guys in my outfit started treating me about the hillbilly from Indiana. <laughs> and, and he turned around and he says, you from Indiana? And I said, yeah, where are you from? Columbia City. And he, well, I am too. <laughs> it was Virgil Henselman from South Whitley. I knew his sisters, but I never knew him. Yet. And there we met in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. On the way over. That was December of '43. <laughs> it's just amazing. Isn't yeah, it, it is. <laughs> and I see him after, you know, was good friends with him for 60 years after we got back. He's gone now. <laughs> so uh, you came back and and uh, were discharged. Uh, did you come back to Columbia City then? Oh yeah, yeah. We, we came in in the morning, a real early, about three o'clock in the morning, came into New York Harbor and come up to Hampton Roads and you could see the Statue of Liberty in the distance and it was lighted up at that time. And they unloaded the ship at three o'clock in the morning and they came down the gangplank and there's a Red Cross or some lady there with a bottle of milk. And I hadn't seen milk for two years. <laughs> oh, that was good. <laughs> and they loaded us on a bus and we went out to uh, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. And I had nothing when I left Italy that I didn't have anything like what I had on. <laughs> so they got up there, they gave me a, a, a ticket on a train to Camp Breckenridge down here in Indianapolis. And, uh, I had another friend of mine, old Sarge, he was from Austin, Texas. He'd been with me too, coming home. And <coughs> somehow or other, he had about 60 cents. So he gave me 30 cents and I never paid him back. I <laughs> <laughs> but we, uh, I left Kilmer, Camp Kilmer and ended up in Breckenridge. And I got in there I don't know, it was around the 4th or 5th of September, of uh, October, I mean. And uh, I called home right away. And, and mom, my mom said, well, your brother just went down there yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, 
So I got to hold a headquarters. I hadn't seen him for two years. And we spent the evening together. <laughs> Extremely joyful time. Yeah, and I hadn't any money and he bought me a milkshake for 15 cents. And I still wait. <laughs> he keeps bringing it up and I'm not going to pay him either. <laughs> and then uh, they outfitted me with clothes and everything. And I had a Ford five day delay en route for reassignment to Greensboro, North Carolina, so I came home and I got in early in the Fort Wayne and the first place I went was to what would be my wife's house <laughs> later on. And boy that was a reunion too. <laughs> After, uh, well, after after you were discharged uh, and you came back home, uh, what did you, what did you go into? <laughs> I had been gone for three years and I'd, I'd had a civil service job before I went in and I could have had that back, but I didn't want it. They were going to sign me to Tullahoma, Tennessee. Uh -huh. I said, I don't want to leave home. And so I went to a local factory, weatherhead company, got a job, and I went right to work. And I got home on the, the uh, uh, about the 5th of uh, October, and I gave my wife the ring, I gave her the ring on the 16th. <laughs> and, uh, and then I got out of the Army on the 24th of November. And I, we got married in January the 16th of uh, 46. <laughs> but we had not been going together even before I went in the Army. I knew her. She was in high school with me. And she had a boyfriend. But when I got overseas, I began to write with her, to her. And we had a romance that developed out of that for two years and I'd get stacks of letters, you know, about like that in the mail. And, uh, I couldn't write, there wasn't anything I could say, but I did say oh, more or less. And uh, boy, when, that's the first thing I went when I got, I had right in the stairwell. <laughs> she come running down the stairway in her nightgown. You know. <laughs> that's wonderful. We had 53 years. Very good. But, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, she uh, was uh, a long-distance romance, you might say. Yes, certainly, <laughs> that, uh, that, that's, that's uh, interesting, very interesting. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and I had friends that I wouldn't get married before I went in the Army. I, know, I said, no way, I'm never going to do that. I had buddies that did. We had one, and I met his wife before he left here, and she was pregnant, and she had the baby while he was on the water, going over, and he never came back. He stayed over there, married. Uh, he got involved with, basically, we were with the British Eighth Army in Italy. Uh, Mark Clark, he had the, the west side, and the, um, Alexander had the other, this side, the west or east side, and we were over here in his side, and he met this WAF, and he never came home. Wow. But that's war for you, you that's know. So hard. The, the girls were there. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Am I going out of line here? No, well, that, that is fine. I, uh, uh, while I was in Italy, I had the ex some experiences too, you know, that uh, when Rome fell, we went in, and I got pictures right here that the Pope was carried through. We all, everybody went to the Vatican. They were walking liberators, and, uh, and uh, 
the Pope was carried through and he blessed us as we walked through. I, you know, 10,000 soldiers, I was one of them. <laughs> and I got blessed <laughs> that time, the Pope Pius XII. And later on, I went back to Rome on a rest and recuperation. And uh, with my brother-in-law, he wasn't then, but he was, he, would, he became my brother-in-law. But he and I were walking up towards the Sistine Chapel in St. Pete's Cathedral, and a Swiss guard came out of a door there as we went by. He says, say it. He put perfect thing. He says, do you want to audience with the Pope? And my brother-in-law, he was Catholic. Of course, he was all hip for that right away, and I, I'm with him. So we went in this little room, wasn't much bigger than this, and there sat the Pope in his chair. And we went over and knelt down, and my brother-in-law kissed his hand and ring, and I didn't, I, but he put his hand on and blessed us, and away we went. Wow. Now, that was Pope Pius XII. Now, there aren't very many people that get that kind of an audience with the Pope. No, no. And I told a little Catholic girl like that, and she said, said, why did he waste a blessing on you, a Protestant? <laughs> she, <laughs> she was kidding, of course, but, <laughs> uh, it was, uh, but uh, that was a highlight. And, oh, uh, yeah. And we, we got to, in fact, our units were all over Italy, and we had access. We could fly anywhere. And we flew over, like uh, when the Soviet Reservoir was erupting in 44. And, I seen two of uh, Mount Etna and Sicily erupt, and Vesuvius erupt. And Goodness. we went, uh, I was in, I had a week on Capri in uh, rest and recuperation. <laughs> and spent in Venice after the war. Got to go to Venice for a week. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, you had some really wonderful experiences. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just, and it wasn't all, we, we had, you know, we, we were American GIs, we had the ingenuity to, for what we, and we could, one time, when we first got in there, we got tired of sleeping on the ground, <laughs> and we tried to make beds out of old inner tubes. <laughs> We stressed them over wood frames, you know, strips, <laughs> and they didn't work out. <laughs> During the night, maybe a band would let go. <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> and we had a lot of fun. You know, we had we made showers out of old B-17 muffler off of an engine, and had hot showers, <laughs> and wow. things like that. And we made stoves. And we had all the gasoline you wanted to burn, you know, then. And uh, this, these stoves were about half a barrel. And we'd run a gas line in to the barrel with a valve on it. And then they put a rock in the middle. And we just let the gas drip on that rock. And it was just like a nice cherry red stove. And we kept warm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, one night my, my mom said cookies and stuff, and one time I got a box of them, and, and uh, the uh, she, my brothers at home had had a bicycle and they bought a new inner tube, and she thought she'd pack that those overnight cookies, butterscotch cookies in that box. She sent them to me, and I couldn't eat them because they were like a rubber band. <laughs> They'd been on coming over about a month and a half. And <laughs> they were, uh, I was hungry too, <laughs> but we got along all right. <laughs> Things like that were amusing, you know. You just remember them. <laughs> okay. I don't know of anything. I didn't. I'm not very. That's what worried me all the while. I didn't. I was not a combat veteran. I didn't do anything. Good. Well, you were supporting the war, and that's 
you know, it, it was the people that supported the war that uh, that uh, their contributions were just as great. So, yeah, so a, I, I, anything else? If we, uh, we had a lot of stories and uh, of the, we lost a lot of men. Like I said, there's 16,000 of them missing in Africa, but some of those were, could come back. The partisans in Yugoslavia, they were communists, but they were partisans, they were fighting the Germans. Mm -hmm. And well, we were losing planes right and left. And one day we lost 45 planes over Ploesti, and that's 10 men to a ship. And these, they weren't all killed, they were bailed out. They were captured by Germans or they were picked up by the partisans. And we had a PT boat there. When they, the partisans, maybe they'd be two months working from Poesti down to the harbor, just opposite where we were. And they would uh, let us know and we'd send this PT boat over there and pick them up. And boy, the stories they could tell. They were, these partisans, you know, were, they were fighters. They'd come down, we were bombing here in Romania, Ploestri. And they'd work, maybe they'd take a month, they'd bring them down to here and then we could run over and pick them up. Uh -huh. And we got a lot of boys back that way, but they were not. And then, uh, <laughs> I don't know, they, some of them didn't want to go back to combat, you know. <laughs> That's understandable. Yeah. We made, did make, I didn't make it, but we planned it, I mean, that was, I don't I want to say I do, we, the Air Force, we made a one trip. We were bombing here, and that uh, trip out, eight hours and nine hours back. Well, it's a long time in the air. So we thought we'd, since this was where we were bombing here, they made a pact with the Russians that we'd fly over here and land, and then they'd refuel and regroup and reload and then fly back and make two trips out of one, you might say. But we just made the one trip because the Russians were just not too cooperative. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, that was about the longest trip. That was 800 miles out there. Yeah. Wow. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I thank you very much. Uh, that that excellent. I'm sorry. I think you did fine. <laughs>